okay? So we used to talk about, you just disappear. Something would interest you and you would disappear and we wouldn't see you for weeks. I would skip all my classes and everything else. And, um, and this is the sort of thing that would cause me to skip classes. So, <clears throat> right. We're gonna talk, uh, uh, and this is a work in progress. I am not done with this, uh, but um, the, the, the question is, what's going on in the frontotemporal dementia's ALS complex? And in particular, I wanna focus on the prion protein mechanism. And uh, I think you'll be surprised where this goes. Uh, so with no other apologies, let me begin. We're gonna, a quick review of some of this that we've already uh, seen in the last couple of lectures. We're gonna talk a lot about misfolded proteins and then this low complexity domain. This is gonna be important. We're gonna, in order to introduce the idea of low complexity domains, we're gonna talk about non-membrane bound organelles. And we'll introduce all this and we're gonna get into some physics, which is why it's of interest to me. And that is these liquid-liquid phase separations. Uh, the characters that will be on the stage are going to be the nuclear pores and the tau protein, okay? So you get this frontotemporal dementia. It's a, um, I'm gonna, I've redefined it here for the purposes of this talk. It's a, a, neuro, a group of neurodegenerative disorders characterized by cytoplasmic protein inclusion bodies, uh, which are derived from nucleocytoplasmic transport proteins or tau. And the common factor here, just to drop the shoe right at the beginning, are going to be the interaction of proteins and RNA. That's actually where we're going to end up. And if you remember back to the discussion of translation that we had, and I said, this really gets to the heart of the origin of life, is how proteins and RNA are interacting with one another. Uh, this is a, quite an intimate thing, and this is just part of that particular story. Okay, again, a little review, the gross pathology, uh, the uh, frontal temporal dementia is just gross atrophy of the frontal lobe, temporal lobe. In ALS, you have the corticospinal tract and the anterior horn cell. How closely related these are remains to be seen, I would say, but right now we're gonna treat them as if they're on a spectrum. You have loss of neurons. You also have a glial reaction and this spongiosis, just a, which is, doesn't tell you very much that there's spongiosis, but the vacuolization seen mainly in the outer cortical layers. And if you remember back to the uh, Wednesday morning last week, which is all part of this, um, I speculated that this would begin in the cortex, really, because if you remember the fact that eye movements weren't involved in ALS, said that you needed a spread to the anterior horn cell from the upper motor neuron. And so this is consistent with that. Uh, and then all of these show cytoplasmic inclusions that are mainly in neurons, hardly ever in glia. And okay, here's the growth, and here, this is a silver stain, so this is protein aggregates, which is what we're talking about. And I wanna go back, this is a pick body that we're looking at here. Uh, and when you look at that, don't you believe that it's bound by a membrane? Don't you believe that there's like a lysosome or something like that that's filled with protein? Well, there isn't. There's no boundary to this thing. That's, that's where we're going. There is no boundary, in fact. This is an accumulation of protein which have aggregated into a gel-like state. And here's a, a new piece of pathology. This is uh, stain for TDP43, which we'll come back to. And you can see the fibrils that exist. And here also you can see what they call skein-like inclusions, like a skein, I guess like a skein of yarn and these sorts of things. And you can just sort of see this staining with the TDP43. Oops. Oh. That's interesting. Huh. Weird. Okay, anyway, um, in ALS, uh, to, there's a, a review for us here. 97% of the proteins that accumulate in ALS are uh, TDP43. Um, rarely you will see this fuse, I'm gonna call it fuse or SOD1. In frontotemporal dementias, half of the cases are this TDP43, 10% of fuse or related proteins and you have 40% tau, which you really don't find in ALS. So clearly there's some difference. Um, all, and here's the thing, all of the involved proteins that we're talking about, all of them have 
a prion-like domain. And I'm gonna stop calling it a prion-like domain. Instead, I'm gonna call it a low complexity domain. And you'll see why I do that, because these are, it looks like these are intimately related to one another. They are ubiquinated in the inclusion bodies, but you, the, you, ubiquination is, is a part of the story that I haven't gotten to yet. Um, here you have some EM. These are just uh, fibrils that are accumulating here. Um, uh, this is tau. And here you have tau immunostaining. And again, it looks like these are membrane bound organelles, except here you see that there's a fuzz to it that doesn't look membrane bound. In fact, they're not membrane bound. Um, so now we're gonna get into a couple questions here. And that is, why does misfolding lead to cell death? Well, this is not gonna be a major topic today. And the answer is, we don't know. We really don't know, okay, period. Um, you could imagine that pulling these <coughs> proteins, which are aggregating out of their normal function, that may in itself be the problem. You lose the function of the protein, it can't do its job. Well, then whatever that function is, is critical to the cell and degenerates. Or because these things fold and create fibrils or take up space in aggregates, that they physically interfere or there may be other uh, kinds of interference where they interfere metabolically. I would also add another possibility, and that is whatever it is that's leading to this aggregation may actually be the problem. That the, the aggregation totally may be an epiphenomena that we're just observing. And it has honestly nothing to do with anything. The question is, why is it occurring? And we don't know the answer to that. For the rest of the time, we're gonna focus on physical chemistry though. And we're gonna focus on the issue of misfolding proteins and how we get to a misfolded protein. So before we get to that, but related to it, we wanna to begin to ask ourselves, why do certain proteins have these low complexity domains? A low complexity domain <clears throat> is generally speaking, <clears throat> a di-amino acid pair. So like phenylalanine glycine. And then you just have these repeats of phenylalanine glycine, phenylalanine glycine. We often talk, when we talk about repeats, we're usually talking about RNA repeats, right? Poly A or other RNA repeats. Huntington's disease is a problem of, of excessive uh, repeats. But the RNA repeats translate into amino acid repeats. So you're gonna see GGG, GCC, okay? This glycine alanine. So glycine alanine, so these are low complexity domains, right? Okay, and then the question is, is there a relationship between low complexity domains and prion-like misfolding? <clears throat> and this is where now we get into non-membrane bound organelles. And this is under normal circumstances. This is not topology yet. So we're all used to thinking about, I certainly am used to thinking about membrane delimited organelles. The, uh, lysosome being an example, the mitochondria being an example, the nucleus being an example. So we're used to thinking in terms of membrane delimited organelles and the plasmic reticulum. But there are also um, non, so membraneless intracellular assemblages or condensates. Condensates is a good word because this is what we're going to be talking about. And these occur under normal circumstances. The stress granule, for instance, is not membrane bound. It is a dense cytoplasmic aggregation of proteins and RNA. Boy, are you gonna hear that over and over? Protein and RNA, okay? That appear when the cell is under stress, hence are called stress granules. And what happens basically is that the cell stops translating the RNA. It just goes, I'm under stress. I don't wanna be making any new proteins right now. Let me just survive and then I'll figure it out. And it just stops making new proteins, which means it takes the RNA and it sequesters it in a locked in state. Okay, that's a stress granule. A very uh, common and prominent uh, membraneless organelle is the nucleolus. Okay, obviously in the nucleus. Um, and here, what you have is a nuclear structure that is, this is the site of ribosomal RNA transcription, very selective here and pre-RNA processing and ribosome unit assembly. That's what, so rib, the nucleus is all about creating ribosomes. It's a compact body. You can see it all the time in the nucleus. There's no membrane, okay? Therefore, whatever it is that's in there, since it's not membrane bound, is self-annealing, okay? Is holding itself together, 
That's what we're talking about. And so this cartoon just shows you the basic idea of the stress granule and the nucleus. And here, RNA is um, exiting the nucleus. It wants to be trans, uh, translated, but under periods of stress, uh, instead it goes to a, to a stress granule. The cell can decide that it needs to kill itself or it can just hold it in a pea body waiting for later on, process it, hold it. Um, it can just lysosome and degrade the whole thing and reuse the components. All right, in the nucleolus, again, you have this uh, a granular component in the nucleolus. You have these fibrillar centers where you have the transcription and dense fibrillar components. So you have various degrees of density within this non-membrane bound aggregate of protein and RNA, okay? Some of it is dispersed and some of it is condensed even within the body. So there's, there's all sorts of things going on inside these things. <clears throat> now, new concept. This lecture is just filled with new concepts. So phase separation. So non-membrane bound organelles, which is what we're talking about, are liquid-liquid phase separations, right? They're like an oil droplet. So you're used to phase transitions, right? If you take water and make it down below four degrees centigrade, as you're approaching zero, you make ice. Right? And the ice separates from the water. Okay, You still might have ice floating in the water under certain circumstances, or uh, you can go in the other direction and heat the water, and pretty soon it's going to boil. But at some point, what you have are little gaseous bubbles in the water, which are forming, and then they seed, and then they boil off. Okay, But at some point, you had this physical separation. But you can have those, those are solid or gaseous, solid, solid to liquid liquid to gas separations. But now we wanna talk about liquid-liquid separations, okay? Not, not a phase change, all right, but phase separation. And the easiest by far is just to take oil and shake the oil and you end up with a, you know, a miscible mixture, okay? Let it sit and they separate. That's a liquid-liquid that's a phase separation. And that's what's going on. So we see liquid-liquid phase separations in, in the cell, and nearly all of them, so far as I know, all of them, are a combination of protein and RNA. So there's something about this combination which results in the phase separation. We'll, we'll look at this in more detail. I don't want you to think, however, because we started with oil, I don't want you to think that this is just a homogeneous mixture. It's not. And in fact, you're going to have many different low complexity domains that consist of different amino acid pairs. And there's a reason that they're different. If one was better than the other were universally available for all functions, the cell would only use one, but it doesn't. It uses lots of different dinucleotide diamino acid pairs. And these are because the exact pair induces certain physical chemical properties that are very rich. So inside these phase separations, there's going to be a whole lot going on. These are not just going to be oil droplets floating around in the cell. These are going to be, these have protein and RNA. In addition, you're going to see that once this phase separation occurs, in the phase separation, there is a tendency toward a solid state phase transition. And that's when you're going to get into the aggregated proteins that are the pathologic proteins. Okay, we're going to look at this in more detail. So oil and water, stir it up with a propeller, make the mix, separate. And when you do that, you get these little fat globules, right? I mean, that's what you do when you stir. The, the oil never mixes with the water. It just makes little droplets. Here's a situation where um, here you have a mixture of four different peptides, or four or more different peptides. And what's happening is they're going to aggregate. Typically, they aggregate because the concentration becomes high and they start to interact with one another. There can be very specific interactions or not. But as they start to interact, um, in the cases where the interactions are specific, they actually start to exclude other proteins and get rid of the ones that they don't want, or they might get rid of RNA, okay? And pretty soon you have a relatively homogeneous mixture, okay, which has formed its own little domain. Right? That's what it is. It's its own domain in the cell. 
This is an example of an uh, RNA binding domain and a protein, uh, um, I don't know what, loving domain, I don't know. And so this is just a little detail, but the idea is that inside this droplet are a mixture of proteins, one of which, at least one of which, interacts with RNA. Okay, and chances are, we'll talk about what happens with or without the RNA and what changes when there is or isn't RNA in these droplets. I like this slide a lot because you can do this two different ways. You can have multivalent proteins which are capable of interacting with one another. They go right to each other, <laughs> hold on to each other, exclude everybody else, and they are a, their own domain. But this is not the group that we're talking about. This occurs. This is, not, uh, this is not part of our story. Our story is over here. Our story is in the group that are disordered, okay? Not like this, but like this. Because this disorder, okay, these low complexity domains are what create the disorder. They are not tightly packed or they don't have a fixed configuration for the purpose of an enzyme. They're very, very fluid, okay? They interact with one another. They're, they're doing something. And this is where I haven't, this is sort of where my time runs out as to what the chemistry, what the physics is as they're doing this, sliding past one another. But they're creating a very, uh, within here, they are creating a very fluid <laughs> domain that, as, you, as we'll, we will explain more, um, enhances the interactions between different proteins or between different parts of the RNA or between protein and RNA. And those interactions, which are specific, are enabled by being in this fluid structure, okay? So that's here. And here's some EM of these globules. This is a, uh, a heteronuclear RNA particle, and it's staining. So these are, these are real, and they occur spontaneously. If you just put them in a, in a beaker, they'll do this, okay? They, this is, they're intending to do this. So the low complexity domain is essential to mixing things that aren't normally mixed, that have a hard time approaching one another in the presence of bulk water. The bulk water, now we're gonna be talking about dielectric constants and viscosity, okay? Water's dielectric constant is very high, it's 80. That dielectric constant is just a measure of the polarity of the, of the solvent, okay? So the thing is, is that water is very, right, has, the oxygen is negatively charged, the protons are positively charged. I mean, not, they're not ions, but the electrons gravitate toward the oxygen and away from the hydrogen. So the water will line up. Because it lines up, it's capable of shielding charge, okay? So that means that, that mild, mild electron-proton separations are gonna have a hard time interacting with one another in water. So you need to get rid of water if you're going to have, if, so ions will interact well in water, but if it's not an ion, if it's just, like I said, a little charge separation along a molecule, a carbonyl group or something that's not ionic, but has a little charge separation, that's going to, they, they will be shielded by bulk water. So it, in order to get these interactions to occur, you need a different, you need a different solvent environment. It has to be fluid. They have to be able to approach each other. They have to be able to leave when they want have to interact but so so inside these phase separations you're creating basically a new environment in which these macromolecules can and they carry the environment with them that's what's interesting is they're part of the protein it brings its own solvation system with it and, and i find that really interesting so they create their own fluid structures that allow the integration when they come together they unshield these moieties which are which are now capable of interacting very strongly, okay? Now, if you put it in a non-polar environment, if you put it in oil, these charge separations would precipitate. They won't go into the oil. So you need to get in between, all right? Um, but in this process of creating these phase separations, you induce areas which are now very high concentrations of, of colloids of the protein or RNA, and this runs the risk that they will induce further phase changes in themselves. The exact properties are going to depend very much on the amino acid pair, okay, the diamino acid. If it's a, if the, if the amino acids are neutral, we're going to look at glycine alanine, for instance, as an example. Then they're pretty hydrophobic. There's not a lot of charge in there. They tend to eliminate water. Their viscosity, 
viscosity uh, is going to be very high. But then if you put RNA into them, then the viscosity goes down. So in other words, in the absence of RNA, these protein aggregates, the protein aggregates by themselves will aggregate. They will begin to align themselves with one another and the viscosity is gonna go up. It's gonna be like molasses or something like that. But when you put RNA into this mix, then, then they don't align very well. And instead the motion becomes much more fluid, okay? And the dielectric constant in a pure hydrophobic protein like this is gonna be fairly low. This is the lower limit. That is, so alcohol, ethanol is 20. Okay, just dielectric constant. Water is 80, okay? Um, uh, what shall I say? Methane, just methane itself, uh, maybe has a dielectric constant of two, okay? Um, oils, just, just oils, not fatty acids, but oils. Um, dielectric constant of one to two, all right? They don't, they don't orient around charge, okay? So seven is the minimum. Uh, then you, on the other extreme, and, and, and sorry, when you do this, like I said, you unshield these moieties and leave them interact. And when you, but on the other hand, your dinucleotide, di, di amino acid may contain a charged molecule. We're gonna see arginine and glycine. And arginine is very charged molecule. And um, that air, then that domain will have a, a moderately polar dielectric constant. So again, what I'm saying is that inside these phase separated domains, depending on the amino acid pair, you're capable of creating almost a non-polar environment all the way out to a non-water containing, but relatively polar environment. And that's where the problem begins, okay? Because now when you put these things together, so here's RNA and protein starting to wanna to interact. When they're out in the cytoplasm, they're, they're low concentration. But when they start to anneal with one another and create these non-membrane brown granules, the concentration is very, very high. It's like a colloid, okay? So if you could touch it, it would be sticky, right? And, and when that happens, then here, they start excluding certain proteins. They come together, they mix together. So they go from a liquid, liquid phase separation, a liquid droplet, all the way to a hydrogel. Actually now make hydrogel, okay? And then from the hydrogel, they go on to a liquid crystal. Now you're familiar with liquid crystal because the bilayer is a liquid crystal. So the membrane bilayer is called the liquid crystal. These are liquid crystals. So they're not rigid yet. They're still mobile. They're still capable of moving around. But look at the alignment that is drawn in this cartoon character. And so not a, it won't take much for the next transition to an amyloid black fiber. So here, this is, this is basically one of the theories of what's going on in these. That is, you start with a, a liquid droplet, which typically is gonna be protein and RNA. Um, the concentration goes up and they start to interact with one another strongly making a gel. Um, that's what you want. This is actually their, their, their functional state, okay? But tip it over, just, just, just do it a little bit wrong. A, a, a mutation, a change in the environment, and you end up with a liquid crystal, which transitions almost spontaneously into amyloid from black fibers. The term is co-acervation. And this is, you use it in biology, uh, in the industry to make polymers, polymer beads, that sort of thing. That's how they do it. And here in biology, this is the fused protein. Um, and notice the RNA coming in. So now you have fuse and RNA in an RNP, ribonuclear particle granule. All right. If you um, if you don't do anything, we're going to talk about hyperphosphorylated tau. Every one is different. In this case, if you phosphorylate them, you prevent the amyloid fibrils. Okay. In in tau, if you phosphorylate them, you promote amyloid fibrils. So everyone's different. All these systems are different. They're all following the same physical chemistry, but but their actual function uh, is quite different from one another. And so. Uh, and if you phosphorylate them, you disrupt uh, amyloid for formation and they can go about and do their thing. But if you don't, if in this particular case, if there's no phosphorylation, then they aggregate and make beta cleavage sheets. All right. So now let's, let's continue this story, but let's take the story 
into the nuclear pore. Okay, so we're going right into the nuclear pore. Same story that we've been talking about. And first of all, let's just, this is for nuclear transport. Uh, RNA particles got to get out of the nucleus. Proteins and signals, corticospinal, right? We, not corticospinal, the, the corticosteroid receptor. Remember the steroid receptor was a big protein. It was a big mobile protein. That has to get into the nucleus. So these are large things that have to be chaperoned in and out, okay? And this was our, our cartoon of the nuclear pore and you going in, so you can import stuff from uh, a carrier ferrin, which interacts with the macromolecule like the corticosteroid receptor that you wanna bring into the nucleus to affect. So it, once inside the nucleus, it's a, it's a transfer factor, right? That's what we call them, a transfer factor, which means it's capable of regulating the transcription of DNA. So that's how they get in. And then once the DNA is transcribed into RNA, it needs to get out. And, and notice that there is a RAN GTP. If you remember RAN, <coughs> remember G proteins. We had three membrane bound G proteins, and there was one small G protein that interacted with GTP as a G protein. That's RAN. And that, that is a signal system to let them in and out of the pore. Um, the, all that I want on this is to show you how many different proteins and factors are involved in going in. And these are, these are all just to, in this case, all of these are just to leave the pore. This is a high, forget highly regulated. This is an unbelievably complex system. <clears throat> here's the RNA, sorry, here's the, uh, the DNA being transcribed by RNA polymerase too, remember that, making RNA. RNA is then going to have to be chaperoned. The RNA, naked RNA is not getting through this pore, okay? Because it's not going to make it through this environment in the center of the pore, which is going to be a hydrogel, which is going to require protein RNA interaction in the correct environment to get through there, okay? So that's what's going on. RNA binding proteins, and this this is this uh, this quadrant is normal, okay. This is the sort of thing I'm not going to take time to go over this. This is the sort of thing that goes on with the TDP43 mutation. This is the one that goes on with the C9R72, what uh, uh, Dr. Hyman Patterson just called C9, okay. And uh, we'll come back to these. We'll we'll talk about them. And here's Huntington's disease, and all of them uh, imply that the nuclear pore has come apart. These are all parts of the nuclear pore, which are now stuck to the TDP43, which is aggregating, aggregating, aggregating. Lots of different ways to cause TDP43 to aggregate, okay? Pardon? Yeah, CD9 is important. Well, I'll come back to CD9. I will talk about CD9. I think that this is an incredibly important diagram. I, I want you to spend the time to look at this diagram. First of all, look, here's, a, here's a reflective membrane. So here's your nuclear pore. Notice that there's a protein which is making a collar. Okay, so there's your collar protein. Then you have, to either side of it, you have an inner ring protein and an outer ring protein, okay, a series of these proteins. And then you have the nuclear basket and you also have the cytoplasm, cytoplasmic filament. So this is going to be your entry site. This is you knock on the door and get let in here, or knock on the door and get let in here. But this is the door. This is what you've got to go through. This is a, a long tube. I mean, this was this is a 120 nanometer structure. This thing is huge. Okay. This is a long distance. And it's drawn in such a way, and this is what I really like about this cartoon. It's drawn in such a way that you see it. As a as one of these chaotic uh, chaotic environments that we've been talking about, this whole thing is liquid droplet gel, and the whole transport mechanism requires a protein to be interacting with RNA and then interact with this guy and work its way through, and it's doing so in a unstructured environment. It's not. It's not handing, handing like, like we think of like when we talked about cytoplasmic transport and you have a dying in like a ratchet. This is not doing that. This is going in a stream. I think of it as a stream. It's just getting in a stream and it just, it could, and then it's, it's like, uh, you know, what do you call it? Uh, 
warp speed, you know, it just, it hits this thing. It's like a river. Okay. And, and it's just moving. It's just a fluid environment. So here are EM and immunostaining of the uh, collar proteins, uh, different uh, NUPS or nuclear proteins is what NUPS, nuclear protein. Okay. There are, there are like 120 of them. I mean, there's just 190, I don't know. There's a huge number that, uh, that are necessary to make the structure work properly, okay? And, uh, and this, is the, this is the core, it's 180 nanometers long. This is a long distance. This is, this is a very long distance. And this is where the nucleo, the, the RNA protein particle has to traverse. And this is, this is all that. It's just this, this gel that it's flowing through, okay? And it's in and out, in and out, okay? I love it. I mean, I just, I think this is, this is one of the most beautiful stories I've seen in a very long time. That's why I say, I, I would just go away. If I, if I weren't chairman and had responsibility, I'm telling you, I'd be gone for a month. I, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't see me. I just, I find this, and I'm, re I'm reading like, I'm eating and reading and, and Tao, and wait till you get to Tao. You're gonna, this is gonna blow you away. So here, all right, now let's get on to the issue of misfolding. So this is a review, we saw this, this is the TDP. These are everywhere. It's not as, it's, it's, it's a transport protein. It has many functions. It interacts with over a thousand different proteins. Okay, and the fused protein is a, um, they're everywhere. They also interact with DNA and they associate with RNA, which is the key. I don't wanna get into their functions so much right now, which are, I'm sure, interesting stories of their own, but I only want to talk about their role in the physical, physical chemistry of misfolding, all right? All of the, um, uh, so these, both TDP43 and the FUSE have these prion forming domains, which I'm not gonna call prion forming anymore. They are glycine rich domains. So when I said this two weeks ago, I had no idea what that meant, okay? Now I understand that the glycine rich domain is part of the low complexity domain, okay? That's what it is. It's the low complexity domain that we're needing to get in and out of the nucleus and many other things besides. They, all the non-membrane bound granules are using this area. So yeah, okay, right. These then are capable of participating in that sort of droplet mechanism, which then will go on. Now this is a complex slide, but it is worth spending a couple of moments on. This is the fused protein. Now here it is. So this this is not this is not the fibril that is diseased. This is normal. Okay, look at it. Okay, you have this low complexity domain. Okay, that's low like that spaghetti. Okay, then you have an RNA recognition domain. Right. Okay. Then you have zinc finger. Zinc fingers were used for the. Remember, we made the uh, the um, the transfer factors, the dipeptide transfer factors, by using a zinc finger. So this is meant to need another zinc finger. Somebody with another zinc finger has to come in here and stick to it and make it do something, right? And then these are little, this is the nuclear signal. This is, this is the little red tamales are the, what you get. That's how you hook into the core, okay? That's the, that's the entry. When you wanna, when you remember I talked about knocking on the door? That's the NLS, the nuclear signal, okay? All right, so all sitting there in that one molecule, this is probably a dinucleotide. This is, okay, it's a series of molecules together. Now, you put the, this is the carrier ferrin. Okay? <laughs> this was the, the molecule that we said was for importing protein, right? So how does, it, how does it break this up? So it interacts with the signal, all right? and then starts to disrupt the physical properties, it actually comes down and interacts with the low complexity domain. And when the karyoferrin enters the low complexity domain, it goes from being this low dielectric constant, high viscosity gel, and starts to break up. It starts to unpack itself. So the packing goes away and this disrupts the packing. And then these all just separate with the karyoferrin stuck onto the nuclear signal, and it is now capable of transporting a protein into the nucleus. So this is, this is a normal sequence. This is not disease. This is the way this system works, okay? And you see all the parts that I'm talking about. But 
do it wrong. This is, we don't have time. This is an interesting story where you can use a DNA phosphorylase. You phosphorylate the DNA in order to change the uh, transcription of the RNA. So the form of, it's not really alternative splicing. It's earlier than that. But the point here is that I just like this cartoon because it showed you the fused liquid droplets that form spontaneously. And also that this low complexity domain can line up into fibrils. And uh, here, what I want to focus on is, first of all, that, that there's arginine. Uh, we talked about arginine and tyrosine. So this is a moderately electronegative. This is, this is charged. Um, but then look here. So you disperse the fused protein if you have high salt. Remember, high salt is going to shield charges, OK? So it's going to prevent charge-charge interaction. But put it in a low salt environment or hypomethylate it don't methylate the arginine, and the thing forms a fibril and comes right out of solution. So these things are sitting, okay? They're capable of phase separation, depending on the environment in which they occur. They're gonna, they, they could go to the droplet, which you want, the hydrogel, which is getting a little dangerous, and, and the hydrogel can either go back to the droplet in the normal state, or it can progress onto a fibrillary amyloid. And you end up with a beta pleated sheet. Not only fused protein. This is the heteronuclear RNA particle. This is an interesting particle. Just stay with me on this. Um, this also goes, this is liquid liquid phase separation. So this, uh, this molecule spontaneously, uh, as a monomer, it's disordered. Okay. Put a bunch of them together and they stay disordered, but they stay disordered together. So they aggregate, they, they, they coacerbate. They come out of solution to be with one another, but remain in a liquid state, okay? Mutate it, you get this ugly thing. But this protein, it normally interacts with TDP43, and they co-phase separate. So if you have both the HNRNK and the TDP43 together, they will come, remember I said at the beginning, the proteins can come together, they exclude what they don't want, they keep what they do want, and they make their own hydrogel. So these two proteins together make a hydrogel. Lots of different ways, mutate this, don't put enough arginine methylation on, lots of different ways to do this. And they form, they go on from the hydrogel all the way to the um, amyloid. And you end up with this sort of thing. So I'm almost done. C9 um, is, uh, I thought, interesting because um, you have this, uh, what happens in C9 is you end up with uh, a, a long hexanucleotide repeat, hexanucleotide. That's what I said, GGG, GCC, which translates into glycine alanine. If you just you get the codon table and that's what it is. So it's glycine alanine repeat. And the C9 is normally a, a repeat, a low complexity domain. But for some reason, it's, it's usually never over 23. In ALS, uh, patients with the C9 mutation, um, you get hundreds or even thousands of these repeats. And, and that can't be good, okay? That's, that's not gonna behave normally in the nuclear pore. So people are gonna have, if they're dependent on this, pro, uh, this protein to get in and out of there and that low complexity domain, this is gonna be all messed up. They're not gonna do it. And that's the C9 protein. Now, so TDP43, fuse, what about tau? Now, uh, last time I gave this talk, I said tau is different. How do you like that? 2017, late 2017, a paper came out that said, you know what? Most tau is actually complex with RNA in the cytoplasm. <clears throat> It's not mostly bound to the microtubule. In fact, I would speculate that probably that's its function, is it probably moves the RNA on the microtubular system. That's what the tau is doing. And it, in order to carry out that function, it has to be able to interact with the RNA. And so it is literally more than 50% of the mass of tau in the cell is in a droplet under normal circumstances containing RNA and in a one-to-one -one mixture. <laughs> so tau isn't an exception at all. 
Okay, it's the same as all the others. I found that when I read that, I was like, I almost fell off the stool. It was like I couldn't believe it. So, and this is, and they're now they're really studying it. This is really interesting. So here you have how is first of all, it's an intrinsically disordered protein. I didn't know any of this. So, and it normally complexes with the RNA to form these droplets, but. Look at this. The RNA is exclusively transfer RNA. That's the only RNA that will complex with tau. All right. The charge is one to one. It's balanced in there. And together, when you put tau and transfer RNAs together, they immediately phase separate. They co phase separate. That is completely controlled by the salt separate uh, salt concentration and temperature, meaning the cell is going to have control over these. It can assemble and deassemble at any time it wants. Okay, when you do the physical chemistry, and this is what I used to do. This is this is what my PhD was in. These are they're still using the same tools that I use. A lot of fluorescence. I did a lot of fluorescence spectroscopy. And what you find is that inside the droplet, the tau is the same as it is in bulk solution. It's no different. It doesn't. It it's not bound. Okay, in that sense, it's free. It tumbles. It diffuses across the droplet at high speeds. There's no change in its protein packing. There's no change in its conformation. There's no change in the, in the flexibility. It's all as if it's living in a dilute solution inside the droplet, okay? But you introduce a little extra charge, hypomethylate the arginine, okay? Put some, in this case, experimentally, put some heparin in, polynegative charge, and the tau immediately undergoes a conformation change and aggregates. So we could see then the makings of why the tau is going to precipitate uh, in the cell. It's on the verge of doing that, and it's under the control of the environment. Change the environment a little bit, and it really makes a mess. Okay. Also, they found that if you look at tau, which has been sitting in the droplet for a long time, spontaneously, it begins to form beta pleated sheets. So it's undergoing some transformation while it resides, while it dwells in the droplet. So it needs to come out of there periodically or it gets in trouble. And these were just pretty pictures, I kept them. And then all you need is to transfect from one cell to the other and, and you have prion-like mechanisms. And all these proteins that we're talking about do that. There's, there's strong evidence that all of them are capable of being transmitted to a neighboring cell, either through the synapse or through the extracellular space. And that's it. Amazing story. Just an amazing story. Just, just cool as could be. The tau inner the tau is with RNA in the droplet blew my mind. When I when I because because I've been thinking, how are we going to relate tau, the cytoskeletal protein, to these to these RNA binding proteins? And boom, it's an RNA binding protein. And, and you go, where does the phosphorylated tau? Yeah, so when so nobody really knows. So hyperphosphorylated, when, when you look at tau, which is in the aggregates, it is hyperphosphorylated. But no one really knows if it's the phosphorylation that leads to the aggregation. There's actually some evidence that if you take, uh, if you look at the kinetics, for instance, again, this is all now physical chemistry. If you look at the kinetics of phosphorylation of tau uh, in a, an extended state or in an aggregated state, the aggregated state phosphorylates much more quickly much more quickly. So it may be that the hyperphosphorylation is because it's already aggregated. And what leads to this aggregation is in any of these, for any of these molecules, we don't know right now. The closest that we understand is the C9, where you know that you're dealing with a uh, fully extended uh, UP. Okay. That's the end of this talk. I'm not going any further in this until I have free time. And that'll be a lot of this. Thank you. No more of this. Thank you very much. Yeah, amazing. Really amazing. Amazing story. And I knew none of this. <laughs> <laughs>